Welcome to Signal Hill. Mr. President, Governors Franstadt and Thompson, Congressman Leach, Mayor Hart, and friends. During this year of WOC's 65th anniversary of fine broadcasting, it is fitting that we gather here today for the dedication of the new Signal Hill Communications would play a flag high up Brain Street Hill, indicating the weather for the day, such as S for snow, F for fair, R for rain, and so on. People refer to this as Signal Hill. Today, of course, we have a new Signal Hill communications. But the tradition of service to this community remains the same. The changes which have taken place from WOC's humble beginnings at Palmer School to its current state-of-the-art operations are obvious. But some of the occurrences during WOC's early history are difficult to compete with. For instance, the foresight of our program manager, Peter MacArthur, to hire a talented young man just out of college named Dutch Reagan as our sportscaster and radio announcer. I know if Mr. MacArthur and my father, Dave Palmer, could be with us today, this would be their proudest hour. It is indeed my great honor to welcome back to WOC our most famous alumnus. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce the President of the United States. Well, Vicki, first let me say I'm delighted to be back here with all of you. Perhaps some of you know about a huge favor that I owe a lady from Chicago. It was back in 1932. I had just gotten out of college, and uh, this was in the depths of the Depression, and you didn't think about career right then or what you might want to do in the long haul. You just thought about, is there any way to get a job with 26% unemployment rate? And Montgomery Ward had just moved into Dixon, Illinois, and they were going to have a sports department, and they thought they'd get someone who had a background of high school sports there. So I went down. I didn't get the hired there. But the young lady that I mentioned, uh, a sportscaster, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, this young lady that was happened to be in the program department, uh, I guess maybe saw that I was very discouraged and thought maybe I my setting my sights too high. And she assured me that no, I hadn't. But she said, you've come to the wrong place. You must go to the smaller towns and the smaller stations where they can afford to take on a newcomer and someone without an experience and give them the experience. Well, it was a long hitchhike back to Dixon, Illinois uh, that night. By the way, for the last 30 mile stretch, I got a ride with a fellow who told me quite unnecessarily that he'd been out trapping skunks. <laughs> <laughs> but the following Monday, I took her advice and my first stop was here in Davenport. Whereas we used to say in those days, the West begins and where the tall corn grows. And I went in for an interview with the program director, Peter MacArthur. He had come to this country with Harry Lauder, a great vaudevillian in a vaudeville act, and wound up uh, as the program director. And uh, no, there was nothing here. An announcer. So now I'm really upset, and as I'm going out the door, I said, how does a fella ever get to be a sports announcer if he can't get a job in radio? And, a, and I got to the elevator, and fortunately it wasn't there, because I heard a thumping down the hall. Pete had arthritis very severely and walked on two canes, or with two canes, and he kept calling me, and rather profanely, and finally I realized what he was coming after me, so I waited. And he asked me, what was that that I said about sports? And I said, well, that's what I'd like to be, as a sports announcer. He said, what do you know about football? And I said, I played it eight years. He said, can you tell me about a football game? And if I'm listening to it on radio, then I'll be able to see that game. And I said, I think so. 
He took me into a studio, it was original studio, stood me up in front of a microphone, pointed to a red bulb up on the wall, and he said, I won't be in here with you, you'll be alone. When that red light goes on, you start broadcasting an imaginary football game. Well, there I stood, and I was all alone, and I thought, what am I going to do for names? And then I said, wait a minute. One of our games in the previous season, when I was playing, uh, we won in the last 20 seconds with a 65-yard touchdown run by our quarterback. And I said, well, I know a lot of the other team's names, and I know all of our team's names. I'll start with the fourth quarter. So when it came on, I said, the long blue shadows are settling over the field. There's a chill wind blowing in through the end of the stadium. We didn't have a stadium. We only had bleachers. <laughs> and then I took us for as long as I could go up to the point that there we were and uh, called that play with 20 seconds to go. And the winning touchdown is scored, at which point I grabbed the banker phone and said, that's all. <laughs> Incidentally, I probably, I personally take credit for the first instant replay because on that famous play, I was the key blocker of the first man in the secondary and I missed my man. I don't know to this day how Bud Cole scored that touchdown, but in that broadcast, I delivered a block that was just <laughs> earth shattering. <laughs> well, Pete came back in and he said, be here Saturday, we'll give you $5 in bus fare. You're broadcasting the Iowa-Minnesota game. So I was there Saturday, over to Iowa City we went. And then I found out that one of his experienced staff announcers, he had along for safety's sake and uh, had agreed that we would alternate quarters. And uh, that the, uh, the, he would do a quarter, I would do a quarter and so forth. And I guess that was for protection, in case I, my imagination couldn't help me. But I'll never forget the thrill of when we were coming up. He was going to in the press box. So after that, he told me that they had four more games left in the season for broadcasting, and I was going to get $10 a game in bus fare. Then I had to wait a few months before, after the games were over, before there was a vacancy. And then I was, a f uh, I went on, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm proud to have gotten my start in communications here at WOC. But I'm even prouder to have been a part of a tremendous broadcasting tradition, one that is 65 years old this year. And I think all of you can be proud, not just of this new building, but of all that it represents. Serving the people of the Quad Cities for more than six decades, when I first came here, it was only the Tri-Cities. We were in the midst of the Depression, and today we're in the middle of an economic boom though we must get some help to the farmers who've been hurt by the drought. But through good times and bad, WOC has been there for the people of Iowa and Illinois. You've established high standards of service to the community, and it's my hope that those standards will remain as much a part of your tradition as they have been in the past. Things have changed a bit since 1932, but in a funny way, the business stays the same news, sports, weather, information. It's a good way to make a living and a good way of serving others. So my congratulations to all of you and my warmest wishes for your future success. I want to say one more word about farmers that I said earlier today over in Illinois. Once when I was just out of the mashed potato circuit and before I ever had this job, I was invited to address the Farm Bureau National Meeting at Las Vegas, Nevada. And on the way to the hall where they were holding their convention, some fellow recognized me, I suppose from the picture days, and said, asked me what I was doing in Las Vegas, and I told him I was there to speak to the Farm Bureau. And he said, what's a bunch of farmers doing in Las Vegas? And I couldn't resist. I said, Buster, they're in an occupation that makes it Las Vegas crap table looked like a guaranteed annual income. 
and it's true. Our farmers deserve all the help we can give them, and we're going to give them that, that help there now. But thank you all. God bless you all. Mr. President, would you join me to unveil the plaque? I would like to hand you this photograph. To I was wondering who that fellow was. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we'd give you your, your own copy uh, to commemorate your days that you spent here at WOC. And thank you very much for being here today. Well, thank you very much. A photographic trick. I was never that young. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all. Would you please join me and we'll take you up to the broadcast studio. All right. This was what I wanted to do, sports announcing particularly. So I uh, he worth it? Yeah. Just around point the shotgun toward the speaker. The station that gave me a chance. And this one, I came to uh, uh, across the river and came here and came across this, uh, a man who uh, gave me the very unusual audition when he when he heard sports announcing was an idea of mine. Uh, he stood me in front of a microphone. Until me when the light came on to start broadcasting an imaginary football game. And uh, I did for about 15 minutes, and when I came back, he would be your Saturday, we'll give you $10 oh. in bus fare, you'll go to the Minnesota game. I believe they had the Floyd of Rosedale trophy at that time, which has since come up with this pig they took away to the winner of the game. Um, at that time, I, I noticed in your book you said you were uh, hired fired and rehired at WOC. <laughs> well, yes, then after the several football games that I broadcast were over, there was no place uh, regularly for me, but they said uh, they thought they, there would be, and so I went home and I waited until around February before I got a call that there was an opening then announcer uh, who on the side would handle sporting events. And uh, I came here and one night I, uh, I a feature in which we used the mortuary's organ for a They got a kind of a commercial in their organ. <laughs> but anyway, there had been a man that they had been uh, talking to and offering a job to for some time before, and he came here, and I was told that I was I, I was out. But uh, uh, he came. Well, when he found out that uh, he had thought that there was an actual vacancy, and when he found out that, no, I was leaving, he insisted on a contract to guarantee that... Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, and... Uh, they wouldn't do it, and so they came to me and told me I was unfired. <laughs> uh, Friday, we've had a very good luck of having a couple of Reagans. Moon Reagan, your brother, yeah. I believe, uh, uh, came to work here. Well, I don't remember. I think he was program director for a time. Yes, yes, and then uh, he left the actual broadcasting business to become a vice president of McCann Erickson Advertising Agency. But, uh, yes, he had... Um, uh, he graduated from college a year after me. He's my older brother. But in the roaring 20s, when he got out of high school, that was before the crash, uh, everybody seemed, the job seemed to be so good that never mind college. But uh, when I made it for one year, working my way through, uh, he decided that, well, maybe he'd like to do that too. And so having played uh, on a championship high school team uh, uh, between myself and the coach who we managed to find a job for him on the campus and uh, he came to college so I became the older brother and uh, I was the sophomore and he was the freshman but then when he got out of school he came over to uh, 
see me and uh, I ended up getting him some things to do. Uh, the 30s, you know, have given us a lot of the programming ideas that we still use today, perhaps the most important decade. I think you did a uh, football prediction type show uh, in between records, more or less invented that, or the first time it was done in Des Moines at any rate. And uh, yes. your brother joined in on that? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, that's how it started, that they then gave him something to do. He was in the studio, and uh, when I was making my predictions on Friday night for the Saturday games, now they were going to come out, I'd see him shaking his head that I was wrong on one, and he was sitting in front of a microphone, as you are, opposite me, uh, just visiting and doing it. And uh, I said, my brother's here with me, and uh, he seems to disagree with it. And I asked him, I said, well, who and why do you think that such and such a team is going to win? Well, we finished the program with a conversation between us. And uh, then uh, Peter MacArthur very generously, uh, knowing that he was out of school and out of work, uh, uh, gave him a fee for and we turned over the uh, football predictions uh, to him and the scores. You did a lot of baseball games. Uh, a lot of our listeners don't have any idea of doing a baseball game from a ticker tape, but you did hundreds yes. of the Cubs games well, here in Des Moines, I think. Yeah. Um, one of the best stories is the poor fellow that was up hitting all the foul balls in the ticker tape. Well, <laughs> yes, uh, I had an operator on the other side of the window, uh, and uh, he had the earphones on and was getting the Morse code from the ballpark and with the typewriter he would tap off what the play was, send it through to me and uh, I would, well it would have to come through pretty worked down. For example, he'd hand me a slip of paper that said S1C. You can't sell any Wheaties saying S1C. So I would say, uh, Dean comes out of the wind up, here comes the pitch and it's a call strike breaking over the corner to a batter and so forth. And uh, on this particular day, it was ninth inning, tied up between the Cubs and Cards and Billy Jurgis at bat. And uh, I saw Curly typing, so I waited, and he starts shaking his head, and I thought it must be some sensational play. But uh, when the slip came to me, it says the wire's gone dead. Well, in those days, there weren't one, there wasn't one fella broadcasting games as there are today. The, there were a dozen stations doing the same game. And I knew that if I said, uh, we've got to play a musical interlude. Uh, uh, I'd lose lose the audience. So I ha and I had when he handed me this, I had a ball on the way to the plate. So I had Jurgis foul it off, and then I looked back and he just shrugged. And so I thought, well, that's one thing doesn't get in the scorecard. Uh, so I took a chance and I had uh, Billy foul off another one. And then he fouled one that only missed being a home run by a foot. And then he, I described the two kids over behind third that got in a fight over the ball, that the, the foul ball that had gone in the stands. And uh, I was having Dean pitch very slowly. He was rubbing the rosin bag all the time and shaking off signs. And pretty soon I'm really beginning to sweat because I think now if I tell them, they'll know that I've been stalling here, that this hasn't been true. And just then Curly started typing. And when he handed me the slip of paper, I could hardly broadcast for giggling said Jurgis popped out and the first ball pitched. But you know, there was no record of such a thing, but for days I'd meet people on the street who'd stop me and say, is there any record of anyone ever hitting that many successive foul balls? And I'd say, it was quite a few, but I, I don't think there is any. <laughs> uh, if you could talk a little bit about the drought. You've uh, been through southern Illinois, and uh, uh, it looks pretty bad down there. What, what, are, what are your plans? I don't want to steal your thunder from the upcoming spring. Well, right now, that's on the floor in, in, in the Congress, and we really have a bipartisan group together. And uh, Secretary Ling, who's with me here, our Secretary of Agriculture, has been working on this and been working with the people on the Hill. And uh, it's, a, it's a program that is not going to invade and try to rewrite the farm legislation as it is, but is to prov provide for help, emergency help, to these uh, farmers who are so beset by this drought all over the United States. The figures are astonishing, and uh, what I saw down there in Illinois uh, just shows that it's, it is disaster. And uh, so I think, I think we're coming up with a program that will have bipartisan support. Right now, I'm a little edgy, as I told some of our press on this trip that 
You know, there are always some legislators that will have a favorite thing that they know they can't get passed by itself, and they will try to attach it to a sure thing bill like this as an amendment. And some of that's been going on, too. And I hope that we're successful in stopping that and getting to the business at hand. How long do you think that it will be to turn this around and get uh, something signed? Well, I think it, I, I think it's a very limited time. They, they know that there's a, there's a time pressure on it. And I think it's it's ready to go through, and of course I'll sign it the minute it's delivered to me. Well, uh, speaking of time, the clock on the wall says uh, we've just about run out of time. I, on behalf of the staff and management of WOC Kick Stations, we really are delighted that you could be here with us. We appreciate it. Well, I'm very pleased to have been here too, and I know what it means about getting off on time. So I'll try to be. I've usually been. Uh, I'm used to being on the side of the table that you're on asking the questions. But, Perhaps uh, next year, if you have nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I thank you. I thank you very much. The President of the United States, Ronald Reagan.